Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 Podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading-edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Today, I am joined with our guest, Suzanne Northrup, who is an internationally acclaimed medium, grief and bereavement expert, TV and radio host, and author of three books to date. She has helped thousands worldwide heal from the loss of loved ones by bridging the gap between the world of the living and the spiritual world. Her top-selling book, Everything Happens for a Reason, is published in five languages. Suzanne has also written the Medium's cookbook, Recipes for the Soul, which is a step-by-step guide for connecting with loved ones who have passed over, and Second Chance, Healing Messages from the afterlife. For three years, Suzanne was featured on the Emmy-nominated program, The Afterlife with Suzanne Northrup. She has lectured extensively throughout the U.S., Canada, Mexico, the U.K., and the Netherlands. And in addition to Suzanne's events and lectures, she is also on the faculty at the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies, which is right in our uh, neck of the woods down in uh, Kingston, New York there, and also the Afterlife Awareness Conference. Notably, Suzanne was part of the HBO documentary Life After Life, a study of the survival of consciousness after death. And as a result of the documentary, Dr. Gary Schwartz of the University of Arizona published the afterlife experiments which features Suzanne as a key contributor to his profound discoveries of science and spirituality dr. Schwartz and Suzanne both are on staff as presenters at Canyon Ranch in Tucson Arizona so welcome Suzanne well, thank you what an introduction that was <laughs> Yeah, you've done a lot. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, there's probably so much for us to talk about and to get into. And I hope that we have enough time to do that in our, in our 50 minutes here. But um, I guess I always love the guests to know, our our listeners to know a little bit more about our guests. So how exactly did you get into uh, life after death, becoming a medium and wanting to do this work? Um, I don't think that this is something like uh, one puts out a sign and say, I'm going to go up and, uh, you know, talk to uh, dead people or the other world for a living. I don't think that's sort of in, in, in the top 10 of uh, uh, career, career opportunities when we, when we, when we uh, kind of grow up. But um, in, in my particular case, and, 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 and I've done this for a very long time. So, you know, I mean, obviously there's many, many people I've met along the way and, and uh, professionals, non-professionals. And everybody's story as a medium is generally very different. Um, however, there seems to be, doesn't seem to be many, but there's always seems to be sort of a handful of us that actually had um, this ability when they were very young. And that was, that was my case. Um, I had this when I was, when I was five years old, very close to that. And I think that it became, um, not kind of, I would say not really realized, but when my, um, Grandmother, when I was 13 years old, my paternal grandmother uh, made her transition. And that for me was pretty key because she had gone through this very long, uh, long term, uh, pretty awful illness. And uh, the night that she came to me after the last last time I'd actually had physically seen her in the hospital, she, you know, she was this big woman and she had gone down to probably like, you know, 80 pounds, 90 pounds or something. And then the next time I saw her, she was her big, you know, self again and uh, looking, you know, quite radiant. And I said, this is great. You know, grandma's all well and, you know, the house or whatever will be put sort of back to normal. Um, of course, not realizing, because this is what I call my Hollywood story. She came to my room and she stood at the bottom of my bed and uh, looking, at her, like I said, all well herself again. And she basically said, you know, I want you to keep up with your piano lessons. Um, I will give you one of my favorite houses and, you know, my, my favorite ring. And I can't visit you often, but I want you to know that I will still always be there. And, you know, I'm in the I'm in the in the moke at this time. I'm 13 and I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, well, you know, all I know is that grandma looks well and doesn't look like she did last time I saw her. Uh, little did I realize, of course, until, you know, as, as few days passed and my mother said, well, you know, we're going to go to the parlor and see grandma and whatever. And of course, I didn't realize what the parlor was until I got there and I saw this woman dressed in my grandmother's clothes in, in a box. 
um, I was quite upset, actually, to be honest with you, because, you know, Grandma was not looking that way the, the last night that I had seen her. And then within a very few moments, my grandmother sort of came and stood next to me. And I must have, again, it was a long time ago, um, either been conversing with her or something because my mother's, you know, she's in her semi star says, you, you better go in the car because you're going to really upset your dad. And I did. I went and sat in my grandmother's car and she came with me and, um, you know, sort of the rest is history. And I sort of had to kind of figure it out from that. Um, I just know that the house was turned upside down. And um, to me, grandma was well again. And uh, I think that it, it was I, I my, my always my, my explanation for this for most people is that I think if we've, we've seen somebody that we love that has gone through, you know, a, a horrible illness or whatever uh, in terms of their passing. Um, and we see them well again, or we see them the way that we knew them. Uh, we have a, obviously a very different view of death. And so that was really my experience. And I had it, uh, like I said, as a young, as a young girl. And, um, and then, you know, of course, you know, as, as, as history play itself, it, it sort of down the road, that door opened up to me and it never, never really closed. And I really didn't, I wasn't putting, you know, two and two together that, you know, uh, this door was, was available to me to connect to people that have, you know, had gone through the, you know, physical death process. Um, and, you know, going into the spirit world. So that was really kind of my deal. And then, you know, I, I left home uh, at the age of 18, moved to New York City because um, I'm from, from you know, I was from western upstate New York. And uh, and my experience was I had all these friends that were studying to be shrinks or were shrinks. Or, and uh, and the next thing I know, relatives of, of people that I knew, of course, I didn't realize at the time they, they were dead and they would just, you know, sort of show up. Not great for dates, but, you know, that's sort of like what happened. And slowly by slowly, I realized that, you know, that somehow this, this door was accessible to me. Um, so, so I don't think you, you know, it's like, I think when children particularly have any kind of ability, whether it is drawing or writing or um, in this day and age, you know, picking up a computer can do anything with it. I, I don't think you think about it. You just do it. And that was really my experience. I didn't go through any rational, oh, wow, you know, these people are, are dead and I'm able to talk to them somehow. Um, I, it, it just was. And uh, that sort of, you know, sort of started my path. And that was you know, a long time ago. And, um, and I, I think that when you have something of this ability, a gift, I, I certainly will call it that. And like I said, I think you have a young age. I, I think you really do view things in a very, very different light. Right. And, you know, maybe it would be fun to talk a little bit about um, children, because I don't think we've ever really had an in-depth conversation with somebody about uh, children's ability to really be in tune to kind of both worlds at the same time. And, uh, you know, being able to maybe see things, experience things, uh, connect with deceased, deceased loved ones or spirits, because yes. they're so open. Right. And they are. Well, well, well. There's there's a few things. In in the first place, um, what a lot of people don't know, because uh, you know, one of the things that that you know the, the door opened up for me when I was involved in the HBO study with with Dr. Gary Swartz, um, that was sort of my first. That was 1999, my first experience with science, and I kind of and and in connecting with, with with Gary, we're you know we're still very good friends. Um, as I I kind of like realized at, at the time that on, on a lot of levels, uh, science scientists and mediums are really not that much different because scientists are always trying to prove things, you know, they, they you know, it's like this gene or that gene or, you know, in his particular case, um, survival of consciousness after death. And, you know, technically as a medium, that's kind of what you're doing because you're always connecting with these non-physical, you know, people that, that have this message of love. Um, and you have to sort of like, you know, validate that. And the only way, of course, you can validate is by information that would be connected to them that, that, of course, only the living person that you would be connected to would know that. Um, so when I when I when I kind of did those studies that really kind of opened up a whole new world for me in terms of going kind of in that and, and sort of in that in that direction of science um, and, and, and the, the importance of it in terms of, of um how the work is. But saying that, um, I, I don't know if it was five years ago or six years ago, 
um, there has been a lot more studies, uh, obviously that have, that have gone on. Like, like for example, um, I knew 20 years ago that people die of broken hearts, period. They do. They just do. Um, now it's a scientific fact. They've now done enough studies to know that, you know, people that, uh, that are particularly maybe elderly, they lose their spouse of 50 years. Um, they generally not always, uh, pass within a year or two, sometimes sooner. And, um, people that I can tell you that lose children. Um, it's very hard for them sometimes to stay here. So those, those are known facts now that they've done science on it. What another known fact is that's been the last several years, uh, bringing back to the question, is that they now know that children up until the age of five um, can't what we would call differentiate between reality and non-reality. In other words, we, we've all heard the stories about, you know, growing up with the imaginary friends. Well, for children, they're not imaginary friends. Um, there, I can tell you, many, many children have have visits, visions, see their, you know, grandparents, aunts, uncles um, that come to them after they've passed. They don't think about it. It's just it's it's a natural, it's just a natural connection. And I, I I always like to you know say that it makes a lot of sense because if you are an aunt or a grandmother or an uncle or whatever, and you make your transition, wouldn't you go visit your grandchildren? I mean, to me, it would seem like an, a natural occurrence because it's about love. I mean, real, bottom line, this is all about love. So um, so anyway, so that they 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 now know that that, that somehow the way that children's brains are, that that's how they operate up until the age of about five. Um, as they get older, uh, that does that does shift, that does change. So many people, like I said, that they've had their children, and they will point to uh, somebody who has passed before they were born, or they will say, "Yeah, that person came and visited me." And depending, of course, you know, the adults or who's you know that they're giving them information. It depends, of course, how it, it is basically sort of like handled. Uh, but they're not imaginary friends. Um, they are mo more than likely uh, loved ones connected to this child that have made visitations to them. And um, like I said, it depends on you know the circumstances, whether the child – and as uh, – probably more children than not – um, I don't want to say they lose that connection, but that that connection most mostly doesn't stay with them. Again, it, it depending on you know the circumstances of the adults around them, or if it is. I mean, I'm not even saying encourage or discourage, but I just sort of the fact that uh, that that door is is accessible. So, um, and there are now more more uh, books on there about about children, and I and I think that quite honestly, that is a uh, something in our our culture. That is very, very hard. We, we first of all, we, we were very uncomfortable talking about death in general. Um, and we certainly don't know how to handle a death situation when it comes to children. So like mm. what to say and, and you, know, you know, grandma went to heaven and, you know, that's that's wonderful. What does that mean? Um, so a, a lot of that within our culture is, 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 is pretty significant. And uh, like I said, I think that it's changing. Um, but you know, like anything of this, this level, it's changing, you know, slowly. Um, uh, but doing this work as long as I have, I can tell you there's a very big difference now than there certainly was, um, many, many years ago when I sort of started doing this. So that, that part I think is, is good. Um, but yes, you know, children, you know, children and, 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 and animals, the four legged people are the ones that, um, are, 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 are dead folks. Those who go into spirit connect to more than anybody else. Much easier. Very, very yeah. easy. And, and when I, and when I, you know, when I address my audiences, that's one of the things that I'll say to him, like, you know, um, do you know you were visited? And it's, it's interesting because most people, most, I'd say, Close to 80, 85 percent people know that they've been visited. Um, the issue is the validation of were they visited, that they need to know that they really were. And so when I go through a litany of like, well, these are the ways that it happens. Um, did that happen to you? And they go, oh, yes, yes, yes. And they they so much they so much want really want to know that that was true and that was real to them. And I think that uh, once it's, it's, it's made clear, unless somebody knows without a question they've been visiting, and those that have been, uh, th there's no way you're going to talk about it. There's just no way you're not going to, there's no way you're going to convince them that that didn't happen. Right. And I think it's that validation, you know, when people do work with mediums, uh, you know, people will walk away from a medium and say, there's no way that that medium could have known that, you know, they said something specific, it gives the validation. And then that's where I think some of the healing of the grief begins. 
Exactly. And, and the thing is that um, it, that's why the validation is, 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 is very, very key. And, and, and of course, it validates the connection to that person that we love uh, may not be in their body, but they are obviously still alive. <laughs> and, you know, whether we know where where, where, where or not they are, um, I don't think that is, 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 is uh, important. It is the fact that we know that that person that we love is is somewhere, somewhere connect to us and somewhere still in our in our, you know, <laughs> our radar. And because, again, you know, I think that because, of course, we, like I said, we don't deal with death at all in this culture. I think that. Um, we have a very hard time um, just just validating that you know it's we're so we're so you know in the physical realm or we're so so locked into the physical realm that um, it's it's very hard for us to you know <laughs> stretch outside and know that yeah you know they may not be in their bodies but they are connected to us and I think if we can break it down to me, which is the the, 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 the key, simple, most significant fact, and it's based in love. Um, you didn't stop loving them, and they didn't stop loving you because they left their bodies. And we're all going to leave our bodies. We're not going to die. Um, and, and even, you know, scientists of a long time ago, they know, they may not know where, where energy goes, but they know it doesn't die. They know it conforms or, you know, trans, changes into a, a, another element. And that, that's sort of been part of, you know, the laws of thermodynamics for, for a very long time. Um, so that, that part is not sort of a big stretch. And, and, and scientists, in, in a lot of ways, have come a long way. I mean, there was a time that uh, they really wanted nothing to do with folks like me. And now it's, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> That's really changed. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and the question, you know, where are they? Where are the people who have passed? And, you know, when we start talking about consciousness and all that, to me, it makes it, it almost shows the intelligence of consciousness and how it can really split off and be in many different places at many different times. Um, and I don't know if you agree with that or not, but, you know, when oh, I've I experienced. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Br br yeah. Brilliant thought, my dear. Yes. Very good, April. Uh, and. <laughs> And, and, and the thing is, if you, if you think about it, it's just, it, again, it's like this. We think of everything when we're, because we're in physical bodies. We think of everything as, in terms of this physicality um, when it has really nothing to do with physicality. It has to do with consciousness. Right. And, uh, and, 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 you know, many people have had visitations from, you know, that one lives in California and one lives in Nevada and one lives in, you know, uh, New York City. And they were all visited by their mom the same day, you know. <laughs> so it, it's not it's not so much of where we are. It's, it's that state of mind. It's that state of consciousness. Right. And, and that consciousness even though, say, if it was our grandmother, that consciousness can also be somewhere else, yet still communicating, you know, with the family member or with the medium. Um, because, you know, I've always wrestled with that and trying to explain to, you know, my clients, too. It's like, well, is, is my grandmother or my mother actually here, like really speaking to you? And, and there's a part of me that believes that, well, we're tapping into, you know, that consciousness, the intelligence of that consciousness. There's an imprint of that person. There's an imprint of their... Um, you know, still of, you know, how they look at life, their views, their opinions, and the ability to move, you know, because when we're not in physical form, it's, it's vast. So that consciousness can come in with that intelligence and give the communicator that information and that validation as if, um, you know, because there's that, that imprint of how they lived in the physical body is still there. Right. Yes, of course. It's like uh, it, it's like they say everything that has been put on uh, the computer is <laughs> is there forever. <laughs> so, right. I guess you know it's like uh, you know. So I guess our, our brains sort of function like that now, or our consciousness, so to speak. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, w I was also wondering, too, I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about the work that you did do with Gary Schwartz, just in case if our listeners aren't familiar with that. Okay, well, the, it, the, the work started out by, um, I was contacted by um, HBO, uh, Linda Ellaby's company called Lucky, Lucky Duck, and they, they had said to me that they were doing a documentary called Life After Life, and they, have, they wanted me to be you know, part of this documentary. So when I, you know, as I, as I went farther with the, with the producer on this and she, and I said like, well, what does that mean exactly? And they say, well, there's this doctor that's in, you know, Arizona and he's doing testing of survival of consciousness um, after, after life. 
And I'm thinking, okay. And then, you know, next thing I know, I'm, you know, being told that, you know, they're going to put, you know, (laughs) I mean, it happened to be quite literally, but at the moment it was, you know, symbolic, you know, putting, you know, uh, wires to my head to prove I could talk to dead people. And, you know, I'd I'd had not such great experiences that in my younger years, because there was a time that, you know, they they locked you up for these things. And, And I said, no, I don't think I need to to do that. I've been down that road, you know, to prove that I can, you know, do what I do. So I basically, I walked away from the project. I walked away from the project actually twice. Um, so what had happened during that time is that, um, I, I later learned that, um, when, when they had contacted Gary Swartz, he was just, he was really just starting this, I would say literally underground, you know, I don't want anybody to know that I'm doing this, so to speak, because he's, you know, a university uh, professor at, uh, um, in, in Arizona, in Tucson. And so he, like, said, um, when they said to him, like, okay, if we can bring you, like, the top, you know, four or five meetings in the country, would you allow us to film um, them for this documentary? Well, he was, you know, at that point a pig in because he didn't have any mediums. He was, you know, on his own trying to do these, you know, these these studies. And you can't really do a study of survival of, unless there's some way that you can do it. And he, he, had, he I mean, being a scientist, I, I don't need to tell you, April, he he had like these, 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 these you know, they, to me, they were like volumes of books on, on how he was going to do the test. And they go, like, Gary, no, 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 it isn't going to work that way because every Everybody works differently as a medium. So anyway, when they when they approached him, he was of course extremely happy, and the, the whole idea was to, to film it. And so then the next step was, you know, how do you go about doing this? And so I, I actually finally came around, and I realized if he was putting his tenure on the line, then I felt it was important for me to do my part because I was, you know, pretty much a pioneer at the time. Uh, I mean, you know, I still am, but that was, you know, before anybody else really was doing this work publicly. So that's what happened. And then, so we needed to, you know, basically come up with the way you, the way you're going to do any kind of studies and you, and, and the way they, that they worked out a study was doing data. So they needed to have a subject. So the idea was that there'd be five of us, we would work on one subject. Um, how we ended up getting the subject was that there was a woman by the name of Judy Guggenheim who wrote a book called Hello from Heaven. And she was basically the one that qu- qu- uh, qu- coined the, the, the expression of ADC, which is after death communications. So they contacted her because we knew we, we, knew we were going to do the studies in Arizona. And if she knew of anybody that might be a good subject uh, to go through the testing. Well, there was one woman who, was, who had had a lot of losses. She'd lost her son. She lost a lot of her family. So she was kind of like perfect. So the idea idea was that we were a team and that's how you work out data. So what you do is you have one, two, three, each one of them that sits with the subject matter. In this particular case, it was Patricia Price. Uh, they had a screen be- between us and her. All the information was going, Gary was putting it through the computer. We were only allowed yes and no questions. And then that's how they came up with the data of percentages of accuracy. Mm-hmm. So um, if I was to say, and, and, and by the way, Tucson is a basketball town, which is what I kind of learned. If I was to say to you, April or whomever, um, who do you think was considered to be one of the best basketball players in the world? And you're going to come up with <laughs> Michael Jordan, <laughs> Michael Jordan. Exactly. So <laughs> if, if, my, if Michael Jordan is considered to be one of the best, you know, uh, all time basketball players and in, in, in obviously, what do you think his percentages of accuracy per shot per game would be? I don't know, but pretty high within the 90th percentile, at least. Exactly. That's what you would think so. However, it was only it's only in the 40 percentile because uh-huh. he's part of a team. Uh-huh. He might individually, you know, making more shots than everybody else. But basketball is a team sport. So the idea of the studies were is that the only way you're going to find out what the percentages is, is if you have several mediums and you put them through the same, you know, data test and they say yes to those actors. And then all that information goes into the computer and the computer comes out with the accuracy. So as a team, we scored in the 90 percentile of accuracy. Mm. So that's how that came about. So. Like I said, each meeting we go in there, we do the yes and no questions. Obviously, some scored higher, some scored lower, but it doesn't matter because if you're if you're if you're if you're working on data, uh, and because that's all about data, because that's what you know what science is about. That's how you you prove things uh, is you you put things through a constant amount of data over and over and over again, and then you come out with you know a percentage of you know, I guess that's how they do most most any kind of test. 
So uh, in any case, that's how we came up with it. And, and that in the book that you mentioned earlier, the afterlife experiments, it talks about all that data and it gives the graphs. Uh, and it talks about each, pretty much each medium. And uh, it's sort of like it, when the first book sort of came out, it was sort of like, you know, ambiguous of like who scored what. But later on, you know, Gary basically said I had scored the highest on, on, on all the, on all the, um, the, the scoring. But in any case, that was basically how it came out. What I thought was kind of interesting is that um, Linda Ellerbe actually had done this to expose mediums as frauds, which, of course, you know, you learn these things later on. Ah. and. Yes, that was that was her whole intent for doing this. And then, of course, when she saw the uh, the actual, she had sort of a kind of a whole different framework. I, it's it's one of the very few documentaries like this. Uh, you can, by the way, see it on YouTube. It's called Life After Life. What I found wonderful about it, besides the fact that you know the, the, that the mediums were put through these studies, is that if you if you see the documentary, there are a lot of scientists in it, which is actually quite wonderful. Um, actually, Elizabeth Kubler Ross is in it as well. So there's some really really wonderful people. And of course, she's not with us, but uh, she was a, she was a hoot. I mean, I got to meet her. Just just a phenomenal woman. And uh, so. But but what was kind of interesting is there really were a lot of scientists and they really did talk about, you know, uh, you, did they believe in life after death? And, of course, some did and some didn't. And uh, and how – basically from a scientific view. And then you, you, you then within the documentary, of course, there were, there were some people that had – well, you know, what we talked about earlier, that had, had their own experiences. And um, there was one story I remember that was really quite wonderful that uh, actually Judy was on a, a radio show in um, St. Louis. And one of the callers, because she was talking about, you know, ADCs and after communication, and one of the callers called in, and it was, it was, a, it was a gentleman. And uh, he said, you know, I had one of those happen to me. And she says, you want to share your story? He goes, I'd love to share my story. He said, I was, you know, I was in the Army, and I was overseas. And uh, I was awoken one morning at six o'clock, and it was my dad. And he, he, he and I, you know, as far as I knew, my, my dad was alive. And he just came to me and, and, and stood in front of me and told me how much he loved me and how proud he was of me. And then, you know, you know, whatever, wherever he was, because I guess he was overseas, uh, four or five hours later, he got the phone call that his dad had died. And um, it was it was a very emotional when he said it. And she said to him, you know, how many people have you shared this story with? And he said, I've never told anybody. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was pretty powerful. So there, there's a lot of those, you know, throughout the documentary, uh, people that have had these experiences and, and you know, th th how moving they were to them. And in this particular case, you know, he didn't even know. I mean, I don't think his dad was sick. I don't really I don't remember the specifics of it, but it, it, it didn't matter. You could tell how how powerful it had been many, many years prior to this um and when he called into the show that he, he shared that story. So there's, there's, like I said, there's a lot of those in the documentary. It's, it's actually, it's, it's certainly, certainly worth checking out. And, um, and like I said, you'll get to see the, the meeting, but there's a lot of, you know, like I said, there's a lot of stories and a lot of scientists in it. And, uh, that started Gary on this path that he's on today. And he's, he's probably in, in, in my recollection has, probably spoken more to, to more mediums than probably anybody else in this this decade. <laughs> so, yeah. This last, last couple of decades, that's for sure. Cause that his came, name, yeah, his name has come up a couple of times. And and I know that I've heard about the afterlife experience, experiments. It could have been somebody else that we had interviewed a while back. So, yeah, I might have to reach out to him, too, because I'd really like to hear uh, more about his experience, too. But um, I'll have to check out yeah. Life After Life. Yeah. Uh, we actually did, like I said, this is like the seventh year, I think it was maybe three years or four years ago, we actually did um, the Afterlife Conference in Portland, Oregon. And, um, and you know, Terry was asking me about, you know, some of, the, some of the things that I thought would be really, really interesting to be cool for the audience. And I said, well, let me, let me see, make, let me make a phone call. And I did, I made a phone call to Gary and, and this had never been done before. And I said, listen, you know, you know, this is a conference, this woman's really, really good. And I said, what about... Because we had done this one other time at the university. And I said, what about doing what we did um, during the studies in front of a live audience? It's never been done. It would be pretty, pretty, pretty cool. He, he, he thought it was phenomenal. So he came and he was, you know, a keynote lecture. And then we did a live, I mean, literally a live um, of how the studies was. They, you know, I was facing the window. There were people behind me. I didn't know if they were men, women, young, whatever it was, just like we did in the studies, uh, through a lot of what we call double blinds and gave information. 
And we did it in two ways. I gave the information without the person speaking, and then I turned around and was able to ex ex expand on the information with the yes and no of them in front of me. And uh, it was it was recorded, and it was, it was pretty powerful. And, and the audience was thrilled because they had never, ever seen, you know, anything like it. <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah. And, and you had mentioned a, a little bit in that story and um, about, you know, possibly getting, you know, your head hooked up to to monitors and stuff like that. I mean, there's actually what what is that with the. What, hold on. Let me rephrase all that. <laughs> I know exactly um, what you're so we'll, I'll tell you, we did this during the studies. We, what we did is that um, John Edward was one of the mediums. Uh, okay. There was John Edward, me, George Anderson, um, and Ann Gaiman that were the, you know, the, the, the four meetings and, and Lori Campbell, um, whom I'm not so quite sure if she's was, was continued to work because she was working, kind of, she was kind of a, sort of a housewife, so housewife, sort of like one of Gary's first uh, sort of somewhat subjects. But um, John came up with this idea because he's got a medical background. He said like, well, you know, if we put the EKG, you know, wires to our heads, Let's just see if there's any activity from that. Mm. And uh, what was kind of really interesting is that, and then we put the EKG to the subject. So the subject had, you know, the EKG wires to her head, and I had them to my head, and, you know, each, each medium did to see, again, if there was any, you know, activity that had gone on. Uh, what, what came up, which I thought was really kind of interesting, is that my heart, they were able to see, again, through, you know, the, the computer, that my heart was actually going through her brain. That they were able to, you know, somehow see that. So I thought that was kind of really, really interesting. Uh, part of the reason that uh, that I think John wanted to do it is because, you know, people are always sort of saying, which I think is is, is kind of crazy that you know that you're reading people's minds. Well, you know, I mean, think about it. You're not possible. First of all, you, how could you read somebody's mind and really get information about somebody, you know, that, that's passed, that's come through anyway? Because that's not what they're thinking to begin with. But you know, people, you know, they have kind of all these different ideas and thoughts. So that was actually. Actually, the purpose of the EKGs originally, uh, but but because of the you know because it's an energy thing, uh, we actually it actually you know proved to be a kind of an interesting uh, tool uh, in the process. And is there any part of the brain that is more active during um, mediumship reading than other parts? The, apparently, there is. Uh, this is another study that was done, and I don't know a lot about it, but um, it was it was addressed to me because. Uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody that, that sees, you know, that was one of my, actually one of my assistants who's seen me work a lot. And she was reading this story about there's a par part of the brain that apparently is, is what you, exactly what you're saying, is, is very active. And she said, she goes, it's really weird, but Suzanne, but a lot of times when I see you work, you're, you're scratching that part of your brain with your hand. Huh. And, and she said it's exactly the same part that they talked about where they have learned that 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 act, that, that part of the activity is more prevalent than another part of the brain. So that's that, that's my only thing that I know about it. So I've got to gather that there probably is a part that is much more active uh, during this as opposed to, you know, any other part. Of you. I mean, we all know that the brain has a lot of different functions, obviously. So it makes a lot of sense that there would be one part of the brain that would be probably with people that are more developed, um, you know, more, more in, accentuated than somewhere else. Uh, I also think that that's true also because um, it, was, it was several, several years ways back, I was having some hearing issues, uh, and one of the women that I knew who was a doctor, uh, she was a doctor of psychology, but she was also a medical doctor as well. And I had told her that, you know, they had wanted to give me an, an MRI. And she was a little upset about it. She goes, I don't think you should do that. And I said, why? And she said, well, you know, I can't give you all the, the specific stats on it, but they have had experiences with people that have had the, your gift that when they have MRIs, it can rearrange, I guess, some of the molecules or something in your brain. Well, I, I was a little freaked out about it, to be quite honest with you, because I kept saying, like, no, 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 I do not want my uh, my dead people molecules <laughs> changed in my brain. That's for sure. This is, this is my life. So um, it, it, she was pretty strong about it. And uh, But the they said that the, the only way they, they know, would know or not know uh, what was actually going on with my hearing was, was, you know, only by an MRI. So I really kind of like, you know, grappled with it for quite a while to say the least. Um, but it, it, it continued to be not good. And so I, you know, sort of bit the bullet and then I had talked to a few other friends of mine that were, you know, in the medical field and they said, you know, you'll be fine. And I was. So, um, so there, there's, you know, obviously different people that have had 
some of those experiences as well. But it, it makes sense because <clears throat> if you think about, you know, and, and again, we're not talking about consciousness, we're talking about the brain. The brain is like a, like a radio set. It's like the telephone. It's like we're using the computer. The computer is, is it, its function is just for us to communicate. That's its whole, it's its whole you know, purpose for this moment. That's what our brain is. Uh, and that's why when people have brain injuries or in comas, and I always say to people, I said, you know, do you think that they hear you when you talk to them? And 90% of the people say, absolutely. While they're not hearing you with the brain, they're hearing you with the consciousness. Right. Because the consciousness exists with, without a brain. You don't need a brain to have consciousness continue. So, um, so you know, so, so uh, yes, I, I, would, I, I would have to say that there probably is most definitely something to it. Yeah. And, and I had a question about the accuracy. So if you're the Michael Jordan, um, how do you think accuracy when it comes to mediumship is developed? Is it truly um, different people having a stronger gift or is it just a matter of practice over time? Um, it's a good question, April. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to give you the, the, the most honest answer that I can. Um, I am, I'm, I'm a firm believer. Um, if you're supposed to do this work, you will. Period. Mm -hmm. If you're not, you may do it, but you may not make a living at it. And that, that, I think that sort of, you know, quantifies um, the, the levels of that. Anything that we do in life continually um, is, I would say, you can have the gift. But of course, like anybody that has, you know, Mozart had a gift too, but he spent years developing his craft. So, of course. In this is, is, is the same situation. I'll call, the more you do it, the more you're going to fine tune it. There's no question about that. Um, do you get better? I think you do. Um, I, you, you know, you can't not by the more that you do it, the more you're going to just see the way you 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 actually get information because everybody gets it very differently. You know, some people are more clairaudient, some people are more clairvoyant, uh, some people get it some, through symbols, some people will actually sensationally um, uh, through you know clairsentient feel the person's energy, uh, may feel the way they passed. So th yes, th th there's no question about the more that you do it. Um, you're gonna you're gonna fine tune it more, but I do think that there is, I do think there is something for somebody that has has the gift or they've gotten the gift because they've had a traumatic experience. A lot of times, people that have had either near death experiences. I mean, John Holland, he he you know he had a, a very bad car accident and that kind of opened up a door for him. Although you know he he said he had it as a child, but the, you know the, the car accident kind of reopened it. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know if it's, a, I, I, you know, I don't know if you could say it's an exact thing, but yes, clearly the more you end up doing something, the more that you, you do define it. But I also do think that there is clearly something that, um, if, if you, if you think about a lot of the, you know, now there's, a, there's a lot more mediums out there than there, than there was, you know, even 10 years ago, um, the levels of, uh, of accuracy, um, there's some that are just really good and some that are just okay. Uh, it's like I said, you know, you, 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 there was only one Mozart, although there was a lot of fine, fine composers, you know, um, right, right. throughout the periods. Uh, and, 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 and many of those composers, um, you know, you still hear their works, but you don't, they don't know of them because they didn't have, they weren't a Mozart. They weren't, you know, so um, I, I think you're always going to have that. I, I, I just... That's just, again, my personal experience, my personal experience uh, because of, of meeting, you know, the mediums that I have throughout my life. And I would say quite literally there's maybe a handful um, that have, you know, really that, that are really, really hot, I mean, that their wires are really, really hot. But there are many people that are, you know, very gifted in, in different levels. You know, um, we're we're in a time period where, you know, obviously mediums are kind of like big deals. But I'm of the the belief that if if you do something and you're really good at it and you really help people, it, it doesn't really it doesn't have to be just one way. Um, you could be, a, you know, really fine healer. You could be really fine of, uh, you know, in, in interpreting um, dreams. You know, so it, it, I think it, it really depends on what you have fine tuned to be your particular abilities. That I think is, is, is the most important part. That that's what I believe. 
Yeah. And the reason why I asked that question and, you know, I do, I, I'm interested to read the afterlife experiments is because, you know, like you had said, Gary had pulled together some of the top mediums, including yourself. And as a team, you guys averaged in the 90 percentile, but individually your percentages were probably different. And maybe I should have asked like, were they around all around the same thing? Um, but you know, if you have some of the top mediums, but mm -hmm. some can be more accurate than others, yeah. you know, that, that also too makes me wonder like, you know, is it practice? Is it more of a gift? Or another thought that I had while you were talking was, could it also be the connection with the person that you're reading? You know, if there's, if the person that you're reading has a stronger connection with you as compared to John is mm -hmm. there, you know, maybe there's something energetically that happens that opens up more to give you either more permission or mm -hmm. uh, making it easier to do a reading. So I'm not sure. There's just unanswered questions that I had. I, it, it's, it's, it's actually, April, it's a very, very good question. And I'm asked that question an awful lot. Um, I can't say in my particular case that that's necessarily true. Connection to me is connection. Um, it, I, it doesn't matter to me who I may or I may not be working with, you know, the, the connection's a connection. Now, in saying that, um, there's always going to be, because yes, you're connecting with the person that's made their transition and you're, you're passing on the information. And, and of course, you know, the, we know that there are some people who are clearer and, you know, and, 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 and in terms of maybe filtering that information, I still think it has to do with the actual meeting themselves, to be honest with you, with that level of, of accuracy, because, um, I may not be uh, as, you know, What's the, I, I may not, I, I may like not be as connected to one particular person that I'm working with, but it has nothing to do with the information I receive. Okay. And saying that, um, there are some people that it, not only the, I mean, the, the connection is clear, but there's something extremely special about that connection, mm -hmm. which puts a whole, you know, a whole kind of level. I'm like, I work a lot with people who lose children and, um, and, and because of obviously, you know, the, the, the intensity of that, I have a real, a, a real affinity for that. I mean, I, I just always have. Um, and even with that, you know, cause children are still children, you know, so children will usually, you know, uh, come, you know, through, through gang, 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 gang busters. Um, and there's some that, you know, are quiet and generally not a rule or more precocious than not. So that, that information is going to be pretty, pretty, pretty strong. Uh, I do know this though, that after doing a pretty close to 30 to 35 people during the studies, uh, with all, you know, at that point we, we ended up only, it was actually only, it was John and I that ended up doing the continued studies for, for that many people. The other people kind of like dropped out after we had done the documentary is that what we did learn is that the people who had the most information, the most intense information were those that had the deepest loss. Mm. And because we were in Arizona, um, you know, Arizona's population is you're going to obviously have a lot of, you know, elderly people there. Um, you're going to have a lot of students cause it's, you know, it's a big university. And so, you know, students may not have as many losses cause you know, they're younger. Um, you know, the elderly people was, you know, kind of another story, but that was one of the things that did come out of the studies, which I found was, was, was really important because I even know in, in my practice that people that, um, that do have losses, um, intense losses that some of them will have ongoing contacts. Uh, with that person, you know, be it their husband, wife, brother, sister, or son or daughter. And uh, it has, I believe, it's based in that tremendous connection of love. On the other hand, there are those that have that tremendous connection of love that because their grief is so overwhelming and they haven't been able to move out of it, it, it I find that for them, the contact is, is much harder. Uh, grief is sometimes, you know, the size of New York City, you know, so um, unless you somehow can get through that and open up the door on some level, it, it, you may find the connection um, more difficult. But but that was interesting because he, there was I, I remember there was a, one gentleman who didn't really believe in all this stuff and then he lost his daughter and uh, his wife would do anything to be able to connect with her and never did. But she always came to her daddy. <laughs> so, you know, th you know, there's not rhyme or reason to this. And, you know, it was like, uh, maybe because he, I, I can't tell you why, but I mean, I'm sure she, he must've been, you know, daddy's girl for sure. But, um, I, 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 I think that 
I, I don't think it's a set rule. I think it's very, very individual. But I do know that um, th th there's very clearly there are people who are really, you know, uh, virtuosos and, you know, those that can be really fine, but may not be in that, you know, virtuoso category. And that's uh, only because I've been doing this for a long time and I've been around a lot of people. So, right. I mean, some well, of may have a different, you know, reference point than me. Sure. Well, and, and since your love is, you know, working with children um, and you have the affinity for that, um, maybe you can make sense for some of our listeners who have lost a child. Um, you know, what, what what's going on there with that? Because it seems to be, in my experience, when I have met people who have lost children, it seems to be one of the greatest losses. And a lot of uh people will, you know, just respond like, why, why was this life taken so early? Or why, why did my child have to die? Why, why couldn't this child live a long life? And yes. I was hoping you could speak to that. Okay. Well, it, it's, it's, it's going to sort of sound like a strange answer to, to, to people who have lost children. But, but I will tell you this, people have been losing children for thousands of centuries. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, this is not a new phenomenon. We've been right. losing children for, for, you know, from from sickness, from war, famine, whatever. Um, in in our heads, and this is, and again, I don't want to say, that, you know, because you know, and I'd have to think, you know, about other centuries down the road, because if you if you read obviously books of people who have lost children, you know, you know, that were a you know, hundred years ago, they obviously had the same, you know, griefs and stuff, but griefs and you know, and, and feelings about that loss is that we have a thing in our head that our children aren't supposed to die before us. And because, you know, your children are younger than you, and they're just not supposed to die before you. Um, and, and, and I get that. I, I, I totally get that, you know, you know, we're not supposed to bury our children. Our, our children are supposed to bury us. But I don't know where it's written where it's supposed to be that case. There's like, there's no laws or rules that, you know, <laughs> that your, you know, your children shouldn't die before you. I mean, if, if it's in their path, it's in their path. And that means somewhere it's in their path, which means somehow you're tied in with that. So I think that you have to, in this, in this particular case, do some huge leaps, huge wrapping your head around that there is a greater purpose here, for, for lack of a better word, uh, of the soul and what that soul's purpose is. And that soul's purpose may just be to be here for a certain period of time. And, uh, you know, and I, I, have, I can tell you that there are many children that passed that I have found out that they, I'll say like, you know, this, this kid, like it's, it's like he lived, you know, four lifetimes in his 25 years. And his mother would say, Oh my God, he like, he never stopped. Well, it was like, he was trying to pack in a full lifetime in 25 years. Just, just, just psychologically and emotionally, it was like he was always on the go. He was always doing this, and there, there seems to be a, a truth to that. Not all children, but with a lot of them, in my experience, uh, and it's because the soul knows. I mean, the soul knows if you're going to live a long, long, long life or not. I mean, I just recently had a woman who lost not one but two but three sons, and her oldest son had told her six months before, Mom, you know, I'm not going to make it until 30. I mean, she's like, that's the last thing a mother wants to hear. But he was very clear. He did it, I'm, I'm sure, with love. But he, like, knew. And he's not the only, you know, son that somebody has said to me, yes, I, I knew or my son knew at a very young age that he wasn't going to make his 30th birthday or, you know. So, but the soul knows. So if you can wrap your head around the fact that the soul is the greatest part of us, um, greater, obviously, than the physical body, even though we're, you know, we're in the physical body, and that the soul has particular experiences that it has to go through. And if one of those is to live a short life, um, and whomever we are connected within our soul program, so to speak, whether it be our parents or our people that, that we know and love, um, we're going to be all part of that. And those <clears throat> experiences are uh, pretty intense, uh, and and the reason why I can't I can't tell you the reason why I can only tell you that it's based in the soul experience, and um, and and for everyone it's it's very different. I can also tell you on the same hand that I've had parents say to me this was the worst experience I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. Nothing compares to it. And then the other hand, they say, but I would not have experienced what I experienced had I not experienced that. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, 
that, that that's that's a tough call. And um, I I obviously you know as they say walk gently on that one because um, yeah that's it's not supposed to be that way. But you know what? It may not it's supposed to be that way, but it's been going on for a really long since the beginning of time. People have you know lost their children, so. Um, and we, and we know it, 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 no question about it, it changes your life. And if you, and I'm sure that you're probably aware that I would say that a, a huge percentage of organizations have started because of some traumatic effect of somebody, you know, I'm sure mad, you know, I'm sure, you know, you know right. all these organizations. I mean, I know personally two of them, three of them were started because of, of me being the first medium, um, the, the organization called the association for prevention of suicide started when this couple came to me and they had their son had committed suicide. They started the organization. It was, it was about 25 years ago. And uh, I was their first meeting that they went to and they wanted to, they felt it was important for an organization to, organization of this, to be there for parents that had gone through the same thing. Uh, it's, now a, it's now a national, nationwide organization. So, and for many, for many people, it's helped them because it's like, it, you know, they would, they would have, you know, meetings and it's like, this is a sign. Or if you feel like this is happening and, and you know, this is, this is what you need to do. So it's, it's, it's probably saved a lot of young people's lives in the process. Right. And then there you can take a look at that child that had passed away to those parents. And then that that's created for all of these other yeah. people. Yeah. 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 Amazing. It's interesting because the organization was started in New York city and because it was started in New York city, it had some very high profile people that were part of it. You know, Judy Collins was part of the beginning one, Gloria Vanderbilt, you know, um, and you know, like I said, these, these psychologists that I knew of that, they were the ones that started, but because they lived in New York and they knew a lot of people, they had some, you know, very high profile people, you know, I'm sure you know about Gloria Vanderbilt and I'm sure you know about Judy Collins. Um, her only son, died and she wrote a book called sanity and grace and it's, it's I, I recommend it to people um it's, it's really it's, it's quite it's quite an incredible book that she wrote after her son died so yes her only son also yeah but um, great well as as we're wrapping up um i wanted to also give you an opportunity to just talk a little bit about what you're going to be presenting at the afterlife awareness conference this year in november of 2018 Okay, well, um, I have the last couple of years in a row. Um, I have I'm, I'm coupling up with a, a, with another medium, and we're we're doing actually a medium workshop, and uh, I did it last year, and it, it was a huge, huge success. So, Terry said, let's do it again this year. So I'm doing um, the beginning part, and he's doing the advanced part. So you know, so they're gonna with, if they're they're gonna go and they're gonna see me, they have the opportunity to do an all day uh, basically workshop on mediumship. Which is, you know, and, and it's not necessarily whether or not you do or don't do it professionally, but just, you know, to either, you know, open up your own gifts and your possibilities and, and to explore it. So that's kind of what I, it's one of the things I'm going to be doing. Uh, I always do groups and I always do privates. And then I will do a, um, a lecture. I think on Saturday afternoon, I usually do a lecture and with, with obviously with questions and cues and easy and give messages. So it's, it's just pretty much a jam packed weekend um, for me. But I will tell you, it is, is quite special conferences she puts on. It's, I, you know, it's, I think it's, 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 it, it's not, the only one, pretty close to the only one that she brings at a whole different level um, that, that a lot of other um, conferences does because her, her whole thing is there, there are people that need to know about the science. There are people that need to have, you know, experience with grief. There are people, obviously, a lot of people who've lost children. So, you know, there's something for everybody. There's mediums, there's scientists, there's grief therapists, there's doctors. Um, you know, they, they, they have a whole, you know, one of the lectures on, you know, hospice people that do hospice work, uh, people that, you know, are, are, are with people with, if they die at the time of, of, of death and, and different things that you can do and prepare for. And so it's, it's really, there's some real interesting stuff there, real interesting stuff. I was just going to ask you if people were interested in having an individual reading with you. I know on your website, you have an events, um, uh, page will, that they can I, see. I be, yes. I will be doing private sessions. I will be doing group sessions and I'll be doing workshops. So yes, I, my, you know, my, my, uh, as they say, my, my plate gets packed up pretty fast. Yeah. And outside of the conference, if people were interested in having a session with you, they could just go to your website and fill out your contact form. Yes. They can go to my website and they can see where I travel a lot, uh, April, in case you haven't noticed that. So, mm -hmm. um, and I do, you know, I travel a lot and do events pretty much, you know, all throughout the country. I was just in Michigan and St. Louis and Minneapolis, you know, in April and, um, in, in this month, um, 
I, I was in Connecticut in, 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 in July. I'm going to be in Massachusetts in, in, in Baltimore. So, you know, I do a lot of traveling. And then in November, I will not only be at the After Golf Conference, but I will be in Virginia Beach and probably Roanoke, Virginia. So um, you can obviously see me wherever I travel. And, of course, I do phone sessions and, and in-person sessions. I'm based in New York. And because uh, I'm based in New York, I do obviously a lot of work in the Northeast. So, yeah, you go to my website and uh, check it out. Get, and if nothing else, get on my uh, my newsletter uh, list because I, I do a monthly newsletter. And I also do a monthly um, uh, uh, blog talk radio show uh, the first Monday of the month. Great. Well, awesome, Suzanne. It was so great to talk to you. And we look forward to actually meeting you in person at the Afterlife Conference this year. And uh, we will have your website in uh, the show notes. But for those of you who are listening, if you're sitting at a laptop or at your computer, it's SuzanneNorthrop.com, S-U-Z-A-N-E-N-O-R-T-H-R-O-P.com. So thank you so much. We I really enjoyed uh, our conversation here today. It was great, April. You're a really nice interview. You guys did a good job. If you want more information about our films, visit our website, path11productions.com, to purchase DVDs or to rent and stream each film. You can also find our trilogy of films on iTunes, Amazon Prime, and Gaia.com. You can still use our smartphone app for both Android and iPhones. Just search for Path 11 in the Google Play App Store, or if on an iPhone, look for Path 11 in the iOS App Store. Catch you next time!